Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Broadsword calling Danny Boy, Broadsword calling Danny Boy, over... Hello, Robbie here. If you have a Where Eagles Dare fan in your life, we've produced a series of Christmas t-shirts featuring your favourite characters from the movie. Please go to fightingonfilm.com and find the Foss shop where you'll be able to check out our merchandise. Hello, welcome back to Fighting on Film. Today we are joined by writer and director Lance S.A. Nielsen to talk about his recently published screenplay for the film Pegasus Bridge. Lance, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks very much. You can just call me Lance Nielsen or Lance Steen Anthony Nielsen. SA makes it sound like I'm some sort of German military intelligence. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> In the middle. <laughs> but, yeah. No, really, no. Uh, guys, thanks so much for having me on. I know we talked about this way back when, and now yes. that the screenplay is actually going to be physically in people's hands very soon. Um, it's really, really, really kind of you to coincide. Mm. And I think it will be released by the time this episode goes live. So I'm sure we'll have all the links out there for everyone to purchase it. So, I mean, I'm going to start off asking the questions. So when when did you start working on the film and writing the script? So that was back in 2014. Um, I'd wanted to write a script about it for ages. And I think I'd done a, a treatment probably as, as early as 2006. Um, but... Um, I'd just done this other feature film, The Journey. It was kind of doing the festival rounds. And I met these people, um, uh, an event which I will regret until the day I pass, um, who said, well, we can get you the money. What film do you want to do next? Uh, which is kind of any film director's dream, somebody coming up to you and saying that. And um, I said, well, this probably won't be the next film I do, but the most commercial project that I've got in mind um because i knew it would make a lot of money i mean that wasn't the reason i wanted to make it but uh, um no, of course. i knew it would be an easy sell mm. for a producer um to go and get the to go and get the budget is pegasus bridge uh but i think i should do this this other i was going to do a gangster film actually um which i have written called six days to sunday which is a bit like the long good friday meets widows it's kind of a female Ooh. female led mm gangster film where all the men get killed in the first 15 minutes you know and um, uh, and I was gonna gonna make that which I could have made for about 150 grand um and oh no 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 don't make a gangster film they don't make any money what they were thinking was it's not going to make us any money uh and how much do you need for Pegasus Bridge and at the time in my head I wasn't really going to include any of the seventh Paris stuff. It was all just going to be set at the bridge. And I thought, well, right, well, we've got to build the bridge set. That's about this amount of money, this many weeks of filming. So I said, if I do it my way, probably four to five million. And, um, I, yeah, 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 we can get you that. No problem. And that's kind of how it started. So within within three months of that conversation, I had the first draft. Wow. I think I wrote the first draft in 11 weeks. Wow. Yeah. It takes me more than that to do 2,000 words, let alone a whole script. I, I, I mean, people think this is a bullshit boast, but I've written a first draft of a 96-page script in 72 hours before. Wow. Me to from, be done. From nothing. From a, from a one-line brief that someone gave me because it was between me and three other people, and if I'd got it, I would have got 10 grand. And I thought, well... Mm. I think I need that 10 grand right now. So. Well, there you go. Yeah. What incentive? Yeah, um, I, didn't, I didn't get it, though. No, that's a shame. Um, it, so they liked my script the best, but they said it had too many <laughs> locations. Oh. Anyway, back to so what, Yeah, so what inspired you to to write a book on... Uh, a book, sorry, write a screenplay on Pegasus Bridge itself? Um, well, when people buy the screenplay, there's actually a big section in it um, from me about... Mm me to write the book in the first place so there's a really long detailed answer to that the short version is watching the longest day as a kid yes um, i think i, I love the bit that. where you talk about having the audio tape yeah of of the film rather really, than yeah. really interesting i love that that was cool well, i used to um, that's the kind of thing i would have done 
I bet you, I bet there's a lot of people out there that do this. You would watch your favourite movie on Christmas, whether it was a Bond film or Where Eagles Dare or whatever. And then as soon as that film was finished, you know, me as a kid, I would rush straight upstairs, get all my, um, you know, airfix German paratroopers out, and I'd recreate the castle. I'd get my British commandos out. They'd be Richard Burton and Clint Eastwood. And yeah. I'd be recreating the battles. And then when I got a bit older, I did the same thing, except I rolled dice, you know. Mm. So um, uh, I used to do that with all the historical films. I used to recreate um, Battle of the Bulge, Where Eagles Dare. Um, well, Where Eagles Dare, not really historical. Um, but, um, <laughs> you could argue that the Battle of the Bulge film is also not historical. Well, no, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Much so, yeah. yeah, even probably even less. Yeah. <laughs> but the one that I recreated most frequently was were all the scenes from The Longest Day, especially Pegasus Bridge and the, the various beach landings, you know, and used mm. to recreate all these big big landscapes in my um bedroom and then um yeah just sort of that was that that film and and bridge too far were the the two films that kind of seeded historical interest for me particularly as they both involve airborne forces which i was found fascinating and my interest in history went from there and then when i got into filmmaking it was a natural segue to want to do something that um, paid homage to both the subject of my own interest and also the films I'd seen growing up as a child. But, uh, you know, Pegasus Bridge is a snapshot, um, rightly so, in, in, in The Longest Day. They give it as much time as that film should. Mm. But but I wanted to do the detailed story of the whole operation. And um... Yeah, I always wanted more of the bridge in The Longest Day. I always want more John, like, of John Howard and the boys on the bridge. But obviously... it. it as you say, Lance, it fits perfectly within, you know, the narrative and the flow yeah. of The Longest Day. Yeah. But just for me, as being like someone who was super interested in Pegasus Bridge, I always wanted to It almost feels more. like The Longest Day could come in like a big box set and you just get a, an individual yeah. film on all the extra scenes. But this what this feels like. You could slot it in. You could get to the bit of the bridge and then Pegasus Bridge would have slot in perfectly there. That's how it feels to me. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, mm. um, it's a great film as well. And I, I yeah. can't how many actors that I'm working with have never even seen it or heard of it. <laughs> oh. Some film directors as well, actually, that even one oh. the other day, and he said, I haven't seen The Longest Day. I was like, you what? You've not <laughs> seen The Longest Day? So, um, yeah, anyway, but yeah, so uh, there's lots of nods to The Longest Day in the script. I'm sure you spotted a few of them. There's quite oh, a few. Absolutely. Yeah. A few nods even just the feel of the script and the, the way you approached it, and you can, you can, you can get the, the homage to it. Yeah, it, it, it's very much a traditional approach. I, I, I wanted to tell a historical epic in the way that they were told back in the day. Now, that doesn't mean that the film hasn't got some modern approaches in terms of the style and, and some of the things like the drop shot that goes from the air down into the LCT when you, you yeah come into the commandos. I guess we can talk about those things later. But so I put some modern... Thing. So, so the film would have an old school feel, but would still work with a modern audience. It, it wouldn't feel yeah. slow or, or, or um, you know, ponderous. Yeah, that's what I picked up on when I was reading. You get the whole, you get to see the German point of view, you get to see the French point of view. It, it, that it, not formulaic. That's not the that's not the right word. But that sort, of, as you say, traditional way of like a bridge too far type of a yeah. longest day type. That's what I got in my notes. It really feels like that, but it also feels fresh. Because you've got a lot of your, you know, your modern editing techniques, everything yeah. else that's come in lately, it still has that feel. But you, you could enjoy it. Every generation could enjoy it, film wise. I think that's what I got from it, and it felt like yeah. a, when you're at the bridge, the everything's frantic and like you know very tight. And then you've got the airborne guys; they feel like they've got a bit more room to breathe with what they're doing because they've got more space to walk around. You know, it did. It felt like a interesting I, I would i think is that that's the thing that i get most when i read the scripts like i can see this would have this would work you know let let's yeah. get it made you know that's what i want I, I, I mean my you know an immediate question i want to ask both you guys and you can be completely honest is you know did you like it if there was anything you didn't like about it what what didn't you like you know please. i did like it i liked uh, it on, Rob. yeah I, the only thing that i and it's just me i could be the only person um, and I'm sure readers can have their own view when they when they read the script. Sure, the only sure. thing I the only thing I would have 
would do if it was my script, I would leave the guys on the bridge with Lovett at the end. I wouldn't go to to Howard in his later life visiting the bridge. But oh. I do but I do like that anyway. I'd like to have that kept, well, but maybe I, have early. I don't know. I, just, I know we're I know we're we're spoiling, but let, let me address that. And I mean, you know, at the end of the day, everybody knows what happened historically. So of course. we can yeah. talk yeah. about the script in as much detail as you want on this podcast. Mm. Um, sure. The reason we cut to Howard in the modern day at the end is because the core message of the film for me and the reason, the primary reason to make it is, you know, you see this guy he's trying to take a photograph of the bridge and yeah. Howard's in the way, old Howard's in the way and he doesn't realise who he is. And can, can you move out of the way? That's mm. a true story. That really happened. Okay. And right. um, and then, of course, when, when you know, everybody realises who he is, they all get off the coach again. True story also happened. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we wrote in the, I think I wrote in the script it was a minibus because I was trying to keep the budget as small yeah. as possible. <laughs> so we won't have a coach, we'll have a minibus. And, um, uh, and yeah, so, you know, he then immediately starts telling the story. And and the la I think the last line in the description is telling the story from one generation to the next. And, yeah. and you look at the massive resurgence of interest there was in World War II after Saving Private Ryan, the success of which enabled Spielberg and Hanks to get Band of Brothers commissioned. And don't forget that was in a time when we didn't have Netflix. Yes, There was, yeah. there was HBO and they were the big boys on the TV. Mm. And that was it, really. You went to HBO if you wanted to make that kind of show. It was a lot harder to get that kind of stuff made then. Mm. Um, so it resurged all this interest. And again, I think that's the message is we've got to, We've got to keep passing these nuggets of history yeah. down. If I had kids, and I don't, but it, much to my regret, and if I did, I, I would be telling them all these stories. Mm. I'd want them to tell their kids. And for me, that's the core message of the film. And if I don't okay. have that scene in the film, that message isn't there. Okay, um, of course. Yes. So that's why that's got to be in there. And Matthew, was there anything you didn't like about it or thought? Not be really, Lance. I mean, I enjoyed it massively. And you got three Piet scenes into the script. I, I <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can't, I can't come out and criticise <laughs> no. anything that's got that amount of Piet in. It's just Great. not possible. Yeah. Did you, did you feel aroused when reading it when you? Got <laughs> well, I was rubbing my knees literally, Lance, as I read the PDF. I was just, I couldn't believe it. I was just. I, as soon as you said <laughs> in the introduction, they're, they're, they're great Piet scenes, and they're they all. Are. They they're are. All as soon as you said in the introduction that you wanted to get Wagger Thornton in and Godbold, I was just like, oh, okay, this is going to be good. Uh, so I read it in one. Then when I when I I mean when I started researching the the, the topic in in detail, I didn't know about um, the actions of either of those two guys. I didn't know that pretty obscure. Gun, yeah, I didn't know that two gunboats had you know packed with kind of survivors from. Wiestraham and injured soldiers as some yeah. decided to leg it down the canal, you know, and only to to find that the the bridge was occupied um by the Germans and all of that stuff again is all completely true. Yeah. Um yeah. and and you know, the fact that they put a peat round into dead into the wheelhouse. These were Great. these were these were two moments in history where the peat was actually really effective. The first one certainly was was key in um yeah, first Stop ally, first ally killed the being enemy AFV in Northwest Europe, and then it was, it was a common mistake that that um, there was loads of little details that I had to get right. Like um, the 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 general um, thing out there is that people think that the bridge was attacked by two Mark IV um, German um, Panzers, but it, it mm. was not. It was attacked by two Marders. Yeah, it's um, SPGs. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah, basically open top self propelled guns. Um, mm -hmm. One of which you see in, you do see it in um, Saving Private Ryan. And in fact, that very same one, um, the owner was going to going to bring oh, wow. for us to use for that that scene. Um, and then we were going to have a second vehicle accompanying. We couldn't get two working marders. So, you know, if you can't get two working marders, you have a marder, and what would it be backed up by? Okay, a half track. So yeah. yeah. We were going to have a marder and a half track, which at night, you know, could have looked like two tanks. Um, mm. And um, well, all the accounts that you read of of, uh, of of British soldiers encountering um, armor, that often it's a Panzer, whether it was an SPG or not, or or a marder. Yeah. Or it was, it was a byword for. I mean, yeah, just, I mean, Panzer is the German word for tank, isn't it? As of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
Um, and I know, you know, I mean, no one said the bridge got attacked by tigers. Um, no. But, and they always made the distinction of whether it was a tiger or, or a panther, if they were yeah. talking about yeah, know, sure. tigers and panthers. Um, that's for sure. I mean, we we um, we were going to have a mark for in the um, in the film later, um, but the only one that we could get our hands on wasn't movable. Okay. Um, so that got changed to um, two um, two self propelled uh, guns, um, two Stugs. That's to Stug right. threes. Yeah, I remember the screen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, because that division had a unit of um, I think it had a unit of ten Stugs. Although though there's conflicting evidence about mm. that. Maybe they did. Maybe they didn't. But yeah. um, so there was action with self propelled guns in the in the village later and um some reports suggest they were a mix of 21st panzer division and the infantry 716th infantry division um so we when i got hold of two of them um because i i shot the scene that, that michael mcgee when he attacks the tanks because that that is yeah. the only scene that appears in both the paratrooper script and the pegasus bridge script yes so we got hold of these two stugs um, and they were both about to be sold off to America. And I said, well, how much to have them for, for a day, you know, with crews and moving, firing, all of that. And I got them both for three grand. So wow. we, we crowdfunded 11 grand and we shot that scene actually for the paratrooper pilot. But I realised after we'd shot it, oh, if we suddenly got the money for Pegasus Bridge, I could just pick this scene up and drop it in there as well. It's been shot. So uh, that was quite quite astute. That I shot a scene that could be used in either, um, either. I remember the I remember the photos from that shoot that you posted on Facebook, and it, it looked great. And yeah, they were just they were just a behind the scenes photos. And that's what I like about the script. Reading it is you can really tell that yeah you know, you've done the due diligence. You've really gone away and researched it. You know we've 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 interviewed people and we've we've watched films on the show where you know that I'm sure the director wouldn't mind me saying now I won't say what film it was, but you know he would probably openly admit that he'd written he'd read his he's written his whole script for his movie it had been made and then only after he'd been started researching the actual topic about the movie that he'd made you know oh, i think wow. it and i think it happens more than you know some people would probably care to admit but where what yeah. i love about your script lance is that you clearly you have a love for the subject that really comes through because you haven't skimped on anything you know i can see you know, I, I can see you having to build, you know, all these horse replicas. You, you wouldn't have it any other way. And the fact that you, you know, you were going to get Alan Tompkins in the legendary Alan Tompkins to help you with your movie. Unfortunately, you know, he's no longer with us, listeners. Well, but I mean, if the movie got made tomorrow, he would be credited as well, a, of course, as, a, yes. as a, either co-art director or, um, mm. you know, depending on which art director I got on board and how how big their ego was, I would have sure. to have a sit down with them and say, look. Um, Alan did all this work for us and yeah. gave us advice. Do you mind if we kind of honour him by giving him a co-credit or a, a, a you know um, a second unit art director or something like that? Mm. Uh, I think if if they were a decent person, they, they wouldn't mind. But basically, we were going to have one horse. So we were um, how that was going to happen was um, Neil King of Summer of Forty Four. Neil yeah. gets a big shout out in the book. There's a massive thank you section at the back. Mm, at the end, yeah. Is, yeah. It's massive. And I've I've thanked everybody I can think of, bar, you know, literally going through and naming every single reenactor that helped us out. Neil was going to build this this horsa because their group actually wanted a horsa to take to shows. Ah, uh, right. Okay. But it was too expensive. So I mean this is how we were going to get around certain things. You know, a prop that would cost the studio 30 grand was going to cost us three grand because mm. what was happened was he, he costed up the materials. He needed three grand. So we were going to pay for the three grand. They were going to build it and they were going to have a way of transporting it to and from the set. And it was only going to be in the UK bridge set. And um, we can talk about that in a bit. Mm. Um, and so then we were going to have a second one, which Alan had designed for me. And you can see it in the background of, um, would you like some tea, sir, in Bridge Too Far? You've got the horses in mm -hmm. the background. Some yeah. of those horses are two-dimensional. Yeah. And, and in fact, there's also one of them in the background of Longest Day, the second glider behind the main glider, which is kind of slightly upended. That is a two-dimensional print. Mm. Right. 
Um, and I don't know if you know this, um, but, and this is why you should have me on as a co-guest sometimes when you do some of your things. <laughs> the Dakotas in Band of Brothers and um, uh, one other film, I forget which, they in Band of Brothers, they only ever had two Dakotas on set, real Dakotas. Most of the time, they only had one. All of the rest of them, including the ones that you see in the field when they're in Austria, Remember, you, and they're playing the baseball yeah, you yeah. Them in the background. They are cardboard cutouts. Yeah, yeah. You There's a great up, article. You can walk up the steps to the door and you can go in them, but they're actually just big, massive yeah. cardboard cutouts, including the wings. They're, they look like they're, they're wings, but then they're not. Yeah, there's a great thing. It's, it's like, there's an after the battle, all about yeah. the making of uh, Bridge Too Far, and you yeah. see behind... The, uh, these these force perspectives. Yeah, and it's forces. all scaffolding. It's mind blowing. Yeah, it really yeah. is. Um, I've got I've got Alan Tompkins' copy of that. He gave it to me. Wow. Yeah, I think I've got one on my shelf. I think it's it's invaluable. Um, yeah. So that you... that you know you see how they did it old school and it, it yeah. worked. So at the bridge set we were going to have one physical horse. Uh, we also had access to filming inside a horse um, at that museum in Cornwall I think you know the guy um he's got the original bridge too far interior glider he offered okay. us to, to film in there for obviously we were going to paint mm -hmm. something but then we would have to take the whole kit and caboodle down there to do some interiors and actually there were two being reconstructed and then the museum saved us all of that hassle and said you can film in the interior in the glider in the museum in Normandy oh wow because we didn't have too many actors in there in one go Mm. so we were going to have to do really silly things like film them all in there without their boots on <laughs> and that's okay yeah. because you wouldn't be able to see the boots in the shot anyway you know yeah, yeah um, of course. stuff like that so that we didn't have 20 actors in and people's boots started going through the floor and mm. then the other the other two gliders i think we were only going to have one in fact uh, that were at the at the bridge were just going to be these two-dimensional cutouts but they would have looked like uh, the real thing yeah. So, you know, all your gliders for kind of five grand, basically. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's another thing that really shone through to me when reading your um, introduction is that it was going to be, it obviously would have been an independent project to an extent, but you really were pushing the boundary of what your money could get you. And it was, it's such, so interesting to me. I love reading all of those production notes because for me, sometimes that's always more interesting than the finished product. The finished product could be amazing, the best film ever, but I always yeah. love the making of. And if you're a making of fan, this book is for you because you get to really read everything that happened. And, you know, a lot of it is very heart-wrenching. I'm really, oh, my, my thoughts go out to you with the process because it was felt just like carrot and stick the whole way through. And the fact that you've, you were still going out and getting all these favours is, is really, really something. When it stalled... Um... Mm the worst and then you know i went and found the money i went and found um uh the um the main investor and i got the budget put up and then when certain people got involved in that element of taking the production forward suddenly it all went tits up you know yeah and the, the budget at that point was put up to nine million and we would have had about six to, to right. spend on the film about six Okay. Um, and, and it would have been a great film for six. Oh, of months. course. Yeah. yeah. It yeah. would have looked like it. It was shot for for sixty. Mm, mm. And from what we've seen from your, you know, the paratrooper um, clip you you made and you showed yeah. us earlier, and the, you know, the promo trailer that you shared with us, you can see it. And that's the thing. I think that's the thing. Yeah. I think me and Matt we've been talking about this week when we're preparing for this episode is that we can see this. We can see it in our in our heads, you know, and the script is really well written you don't skimp on detail you don't skimp on scenes you know you, you as i said you know the, the river the river boat the, the boats being hit by the piots you know another filmmaker would leave that out but you wouldn't and yeah. i love that yeah. you know you're trying to tell the genuine story of the of pegasus bridge the, the, the actual story yeah, i made yeah. a list of kind of all the key things that that happened where i did have to leave some things out was some of the little battles that seven para had yeah Nicola Gregory, who was one of the good producers who worked on 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 the film, um, I had to explain to her from the beginning. I said, "Look, if we're going to just do the bridge and leave Seven Parrot out of the film, 
we're basically committing the same sin as The Longest Day. And yeah. the whole reason for making this film is not to commit the same sins as Longest Day because Seven Para just get one mention in the film. Seven Para might not be here for hours. And then you see one guy at the end of the movie with them who actually that was the role that, um, what's his name, was originally offered. He was originally offered that part. Okay. Of, of, um because that's supposed to be him that's right. supposed to be lieutenant richard todd uh, on the bridge yes. yeah he, then they said do you want to you play yourself and he probably looked at the scripts and went well i know you might see one line <laughs> I, <can't laughs> much better, yeah. I think i'd like to play major him. yeah um so uh and, and who can blame him and i wish i'd met him because i really did want to meet him um yeah, fascinating yeah. Man. there's a and, great he uh, recorded a really interesting interview for the iwm where he talks about fighting on the bridge if you listen to that that's interesting. I think I've heard it. Yeah. Yeah. The I interviewer, I'm sure you have. Yeah. The interviewer yeah. leads him in with a really loaded Piat question, which was really unfair to ask him. <laughs> a lot of the IWM <laughs> questions are a bit off, and you're a like, bit loaded. Really, yeah. Yeah. Was that loaded? Did, you, did you hate the Sten gun? I'm like, what? Don't, don't, <laughs> yeah. don't lead them. <laughs> was that loaded Piat question? Was that Matthew Moss's dad? That, um... <laughs> Yeah. I mean, and talking about Todd there, I mean, who, I, this is the thing for me, I was, when you, when you read it, you read a book and you, you imagine the characters. So yeah. Windy Gale's in it and I, and I'm sure Al won't mind me mentioning it. You know, he, he did ask me when, when, um when we were preparing this episode, if he could play Windy Gale. So now I always see Al Murray as Windy Gale. Can't help it. Um, <laughs> um I, I, What I'll say to, to Al, because, that part is earmarked for Danny Webb, but there's another okay. part. There's another part that Danny Webb could play that's just as good that 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 isn't isn't wasn't cast at the time. Right. So, um, but I could I just say, see it. What I would say to Al is, if he's up for coming on board as a producer, doing loads of PR for the film and trying to get the budget, <laughs> yes, you can play uh, Windy well, Hopefully, Gale. hopefully <laughs> after this month, you you know things can get in motion. But my he, question was going to be: He looks like Windy Gale, actually. He does and, a bit. <laughs> you can whilst see I it. think Al, I don't think Al would mind me saying that his acting range is probably, from what I've seen, is probably fairly narrow. I think he could actually do a really good job. Of I that. think he could. Yeah, I think he could. Right, my... persona, he's the right. He probably yeah. be more interesting than the real Windy Gale, who was supposed to be a bit sort of dour, you know. Mm. And the connection with his father being an ex-para as well would be a great thing. Yeah. Um, but my question was going to be: someone like Richard Todd being a character, yeah. you know, who would? And this is where my, my other question about casting comes in. But who would you? Who would you have cast, or would you try to cast as Todd? Todd was going to be played by an unknown. I, I, okay. I felt for that reason when it was come down to casting, we were we were going to have two pretty big names in Howard and um, Pine Coffin. Yeah, and we, yep. we got Pine Coffin. It was going to be Rupert Penry Jones. Yeah, I could see that. Were, that was good. And there, yeah. there were lots of people in the running for Howard, including Henry Cavill, who actually contacted us at one mm. stage and asked us is there anything in Pegasus Bridge for him? And because he contacted us, that's the reason I felt comfortable mm. to mention him. Um, when it came to the younger officers, because Todd was pretty young um, at the yeah. time he was there, yeah, yeah. we were going to go largely with a lot of unknown actors, but actors that we thought were up and coming, and they were going to be divided into two categories. They were those who were already um, earmarked, we felt, for success in the sense that they'd gone through the RADA set and mm -hmm. they were already with a big agent. So it was almost a certainty that their career was going to take off. Yeah. And I can mention a few names um, that we looked at. There were four people that I wanted in the film from the get-go when I saw them that all ended up in Dunkirk. Uh, uh, um, Barry, Barry, Barry Keogh, or Keogh um, was one of them. I wanted mm -hmm. him um, uh, as one of the... Uh, um, younger um, glider infantry guys. Um, I'd have to get the IMDb list up now. But anyway, Richard Todd, to answer your question, was going to be played by Jake Francis, who was one of the actors who was in... Um, he's in the trailer. Um, he's in the promo trailer. And um, I met him at an acting workshop when I was invited to go and do a talk there mm. uh, Bubble and Squeak, um, run by Paul. Oh God, I've forgotten his surname now. He's going to kill me. Uh, Paul McNeely. Paul McNeely runs this thing called Bubble and Squeak. Nice little acting workshop, and I, I run one as well called the Outcast Creative. And we often 
me and Paul are not like rivals. Um, we're good friends, and we often, you know, I'll go and do a talk for him. Mm. He might do a talk for us, that kind of thing, you know, and we're always sending each other actors and that sort of thing. And Jake Francis was an actor that I met. I met two actors there that I immediately thought were really t super talented, uh, and, and the other one was Neil Ward. And Neil Ward has just done this horror film called Feed Me, and um, I think that's going to give his career a, a massive, well-deserved boot boost jake has now got his own production company called tripod and he's doing loads of things but back then he was he was just getting into acting and he's a very dashingly handsome guy so you wanted someone who you know was going to kind of tickle the ladies a bit because that's who richard todd was he was a ladies man <laughs> so as soon as yeah. i saw jake francis um i thought you know yeah this is a we had him lined up for a couple of roles he he was down for three parts in case, um, you know, uh, um, an actor of note suddenly came along to us and said, I'd like to be in the film. Can I play Richard Todd, please? Sure. We would have moved Jake over to either Major Taylor. He was up for Major Taylor as well. He was also up for Jim Woolwork. Mm, the person right. who I wanted for Jim Woolwork um, actually w was um, the guy who ended up playing Ramsay Bolton in Game of Thrones. Um Oh God, I've forgotten his name. He's an amazing actor. He had, did a tiny role in in Wild Bill, um, directed by um, a friend of mine, Dexter Fletcher, who also was in yeah, Band yeah. of Brothers. And um, I saw him in Wild Bill. I was at the Wild Bill premiere, and I just loved his his face. And I, I said to Sharon straight away, "Find out who that guy is. I want him in Pegasus Bridge." Uh, and now he's got a massive career. You and Rio. Right. Yes, that's the one. That's the guy. He was he was in Misfits. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's yeah. right. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Tremendously um, talented actor. So we kind of, you know, working with my casting director um, Sharon Sorrentino, um, who did a tremendous amount of work on on breaking down lists and contacting mm. agents and reaching out to them and lining people up and. Um, Jack Loudon, who was also in Dunkirk, he was in 71. Amazing film, if you Great like that. Great film. So yeah. that. Mm. Um, really good. And um, and straight away I said to Sharon, he'd be great for one of the main officers. He'd be great for like Sweeney or someone like that. So we had him on the list. We looked in our immediate orbit of people that um, were working grafters that would, you know had not come through the top three drama schools or whatever. Mm. And there were quite a lot of young actors around us at the time. We had a big meeting with about 20 of them and said, look, um, we'll give you all an audition for the film. But by the time you come to do the audition, you've got to be super physically fit. There were a couple of them that were a bit paunchy. So I was like, down the gym straight away, you know, because you, you, you're going to want to be fit because you're going to be running around. Yeah. Um, it's not yeah. a film where you're standing in a room talking to a woman in a dress, you know, you're, you're going to be running around a lot. And mm. there's a lot of scenes on training courses and assault courses. And uh, we had a couple of ex paras who were going to, um, you know, do the Band of Brothers uh, three day uh, training boot thing, camp, yeah. Have them out in the woods camping at night and all that kind of stuff. So all of that was lined up as well. Mm. Uh, so it's very yeah, uh, a lot too far on that one. That's what um, Dickie yeah. Attenborough did, didn't he? Got all the yeah, yeah well, at Attenborough's army. Yeah, and I That's really, it. I really enjoyed listening to your one with the three guys. And in fact, I've got Abatini's book. Um, it's, it's brilliant, and, isn't it? And, yeah, uh, I love his detailed accounts of all the uh, Dutch ladies turning up with condoms in their handbag. <laughs> but yeah. um, my biggest um, collaborator, Jason Fleming, he was going to play Brigadier Poet. We had Phil Davis to play uh, Monty because Monty turns up in that scene, and he did actually turn up. Um, then that 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 actually happened hello there sorry to interrupt i wanted to let you know that you can now join our supporting cast over on patreon as thanks for your support you'll be able to help us pick films submit questions for guests have first pick on brand new and exclusive merch and much more thank you for your support now back to the show they're coming off of cast talk about references there's one reference i really want to ask you about because it made me laugh Go for it. um out loud there's a part where some Italian uh, prisoners are taken and they say they're speaking in Italian, but it would have been subtitles for the listeners. And they go, oh, we'll cook for you, blah, blah, blah. And Major Howard turns around and goes, 
What? No one here speaks Italian. Bloody marvellous. Is that is that a direct and gentlemanly act reference? It is. There? Will Spicer. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a that's a little nod and a dedication to Bob Peck, who of course, absolutely one of my favourite actors. And a little side note: I contacted his agent. He died of cancer, but but um, he did. It didn't go public that information. I think until either his death or right before it. Yeah, and about, four, and about four or five months before he died, I contacted his agent. I really wanted him to come and see this play I was directing. And his agent said, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm afraid he's not very well at the moment. And, and I said, oh, um, is, you know, is it serious? And they said, well, um, I'm afraid, yes, it is very serious. And I, I was like, oh. And then I thought, right. I, I kind of read between the lines and I said, would he do I mean, this is really out of field. Would he consult to doing an interview about his career? Because the, the the next thing that went, I mean, it was totally inappropriate, but, and I was very young then. But the next thing that went through my head was, God, if he's about to, to die, I've never seen an interview with Bob Peck, like a, a big, long interview. Yeah, that's, that's a fair yeah. point. Yeah. Um, and what a fascinating actor. Just to, I mean, he's great, isn't he? And he, mm. he could have played Howard in his day. Yeah, mm. yeah, you can that's very true. He could. He yeah. would have been yeah. a great Howard, you know. Yeah. When Fantastic he was the same agent. Age he was, yeah, when he did Edge of Darkness or. Um, mm. um, go but go I was, on. Next I was thinking Stephen Graham for Howard in my head, but you probably yeah, I don't know. Well, Howard was pretty tall. Yeah, that's the only thing you need to have the people coming out being like, "Oh, he's not tall enough," like you did with Paddy Main. I mean, look, the heroes. <laughs> Stephen, <laughs> Stephen, Stephen Graham is a phenomenal actor. He would have been a, he would have been brilliant as Wally Parr when he was younger. Yeah, uh, yeah he would have been. Uh, and um, you know, it would be nice to it would be nice for him to be in an airborne film, airborne film where he's in it for more than three seconds, aka Bad Brothers. Next question, we go to the Patreons. So, as always, we do ask our patrons to submit questions for our guests, and I'll, I'll kick off with Tom McCall. Yeah. Um, and he asks, in the process of drafting the screenplay, did Lance talk to any Normandy veterans? And then he uh, adds an addendum on the end. Also, with the success of SAS Rogue Heroes, are Second World War films and TV series back in vogue? Okay, let's deal with the first I hope so. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, so do I. Um, first question, yes, um, I tracked down all of them that we could find that were living. I think we've got seven of them on film. Mm -hmm. I spoke to probably double that. Um, and uh, the ones we've got on film are Nick Archdale. Um, in fact, I've got, they're listed in the book. Um, Stan Watson, who Neil Ward was going to play Stan Watson. Um, and... Um, you know, it's a small part, but he's in the film the whole way through. He's, you know, we've got a lot of guys that've only got four or five lines, but they're they're always in all the scenes um, with all the glider guys or seven barra guys. And so I I I said to Neil, do you, we're going to go and interview him. Do you want to come? Because that was the only person who was in the film who was alive. Um, the seven para guys that were um, alive weren't in the film but they they were in the paratrooper pilot but by the time i got round to writing the paratrooper pilot they all of them except for nick archdale had died um so we went up to south end and we interviewed stan watson and you you went in this very kind of like working class um house on a council estate and the first thing you notice when you open the door is that there's a massive framed painting of a glider <laughs> yeah. um and then there and then you go in the the lounge and you know um you know you used to go to your friend's dad who was in, into airfix and you'd go in one room and there'd be all these airfix planes everywhere <laughs> yeah <laughs> stands this was like you went into this guy's front room and every version of a model glider that had been brought out by some obscure company in italy or russia or wherever he had every model of a glider that i'd ever seen in every scale that you can think of everywhere including wow. one hanging from the ceiling. And so he was obviously really proud of the fact that, that he took part in it. Um, and it, it might be that he didn't talk about it that much because I was told that he didn't. Now, now, he told us a really interesting thing, and I will tell it actually because I think he told us it because he wanted it to be known. Now, I think it's his belief. I don't think that it happened. I just think it's his belief. He said 
that when they charged across the bridge, and it was him, Gray, Gardner and Parr and Brotheridge, I can't remember which one of them had the brain gun, but I think it was Gardner. He said that, that Gardner thought that he hit Brotheridge and killed him. Oh. And right. that was a thing that he, he carried with him to his grave. He thought that. And, um, uh, and, and Watson broke down crying when he told us. He said, I've got to wow. tell you this because, because none of us ever spoke about it. And I'm the last one who knows. And, um, and I think I think we turned cameras off at this point. We might have it on camera. I can't remember. It's a long time ago. Mm. And and he he said, "Now look, it's possible that that happened, but um, Brotheridge took a round to the throat. So, um, but just a bit before difficult did, if the brain gun is behind him, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. But just before he went down, he did turn around and say, "Come on, twenty five, because they were twenty fifth right. or two. So it's possible, but when when Dr. Vaughan examined him, he said he took a round to the throat from the front. I think that Gardner probably thought that that's what happened, but I think he probably took a round from the front. I think it's mm -hmm. unlikely. Because at the end of the day, it wasn't like they sat down and did a pathology report to see if it no. was a round, yeah, round from a train or a round from an MG42. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's in the confusion. So we're, at that point, we were like, shit, should we put this in the script? And should I have that moment where he's feeling bad about it and everything? But I, I thought, no, because um, you're just doing that. That's not a fact. I mean, it's it's his belief that maybe that's what happened and that's his guilt. But 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 the truth of it is that that fighting was so confused, you'll never know. And uh, and I think on probability, it's more likely he was shot from the front because um, he took a round to the throat from the front. So, uh, you know, but that, what so a belief yes, to we, carry with you. Wow. Yes, we interviewed. Yes, we interviewed a lot of people and, and there was a lot of interesting stories that came out like that, like Ron Perry's parachute being on fire when he came down between the two, um, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. waterways and and and. Hmm. Various people told us about various people that died and they 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 broke into tears when they they talked about that. Um so yes, and that was very useful and that was a huge honor for me and and yeah, we of course to take part in the celebrations in Normandy. And one year I was the guest speaker at the veterans' dinner and all of that stuff. All of this stuff is all in the in the book as well. Um yeah. second question, Rogue Heroes, and I'll just say now, I liked Rogue Heroes. I thought it was very well done. Um, and I even comment in the book that, um, you know, uh, I, 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 as much as I like these things, there's not going to be an ACD rock soundtrack. Yeah, on. I, I like that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I did exactly notice that too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and I didn't mind that. I mean, I did mind it at first, and I know it rankled a lot of people, and I kind of, mm. but then after a while, I kind of thought, you know what? These are kind of the bad boys. These are the outcasts. These are mm. the rogue heroes. Yeah, so it kind of works that they have that they have a wacky soundtrack that no one else would have. It kind of works. Yeah, yeah, it's I, a I stylistic get thing, isn't it? Um, yeah. But you know, Pegasus Bridge was going to have your your James Horner, um, you know, Braveheart mm. style soundtrack. It was going to be big instrumental, um, mm. and all of that, um, and um, yeah, so I wouldn't have done it that way. There would have been some modernisms in terms of style, um, but I wouldn't have. And I wanted the, the action scenes were going to be very bridge too far. There was going to be a little bit of handheld camera and stuff, like there was a little bit in the thing I just showed you. But mm. for the most part, I always wanted people to be able to see what was going on. And there's a lot of stuff that's a night shoot. And this wasn't going to be like Game of Thrones last season, episode seven, where you can't see what the fuck is going on. <laughs> you, you, you would be able to see everything, you know. Yeah, yeah. So and I, um, I also I, I thought you there's also some humor in there as well, whether you meant yeah. it to be or not, where the lads are in their sort of like uh, first aid post trench and they're in the on the stretchers and they yeah. constantly have to keep throwing themselves on the ground to take cover yeah like, that's that's i weird. always felt like you were going to have like cutaways to them having to do it a couple of times and it would just become like a running joke that they never got comfy like yeah, I just, that, that's what i saw that was that that was basically it um there was an account of somebody having to do that 
I mean, the actual first aid post was between the two bridges. Mm. So it was about 500 yards or 200 yards further away uh, than where it was. But um, that was one of the historical things that I changed because I I wanted to keep those car- – I wanted to cut to the first aid post, but I didn't want the first aid post to be another location that was – we couldn't like quite work. I didn't want to sure. put a title on the screen saying 200 yards away from the bridge, the first aid post. It, it just, it seemed a, a, an okay historical yeah. leniency to um, put the first aid post just behind the pillbox where it was initially actually. Um, and uh, because he did put the most it's severely injured into the pillbox at one point, um, the ones who were too injured to be moved, mm. um, kept close to the bridge and then they put them in the pillbox at one point. So, um, uh, yeah, so it's it's Lieutenant David Wood who That's got, it. got injured by fire from a hedgerow as he was picking up an MG42. And um, him and Sandy Smith, who got injured about four or five times at different points, every time he goes to do something, he gets either fucking shot at or a grenade gets thrown at him. And um, his account was, was particularly interesting and w- what a character he was as well, you know. The next question is from A.D. Bond, and we sort of touched on it earlier, but he says, how did you um, how did you tackle the glider scenes? But maybe he just means how would you have tackled the glider scenes? It would have been a mix of, um, well, we had the late, great Alan Marks, who's, there's a big dedication to him in the thank yous at the back of the book. And Alan was a friend of mine from the 80s. I met him at a games convention, and he was one of the pioneers of, of visual effects, computer visual effects. He, he used to work for the Magic Camera Company in Shepparton and mm. uh, worked on, you know, all kinds of um, big films. He was actually the visual effects supervisor on um, GoldenEye um, and um, Muppet Treasure Island. So there's a few oh, con- love that film. Con- contrast of projects for you. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he did a couple of promos on back the trailer. Right now. Um, and these were very early ones. And, I mean, the technology made huge leaps since then you know um but i think you've seen them where you've got a bomber towing the glider over the water and then Mm -hmm. there's a second shot of the glider coming over the normandy coastline and um he took that shot of um the normandy coastline that was a drone shot that we did um when we were over there second unit and then we switched day day to night he added the beach obstacles um with cgi and a few things and then you had a 3D build of the bomber and a 3D build of the glider CGI, and and, and that was that going over. Yeah. Um, and um, in fact, the Forgotten Battle, which I think you guys reviewed, didn't you? Great film. We did. Yeah. Famously hated it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a frustrating film because you want it to be something else. Yeah, that's uh, it. Yeah. I enjoyed yeah. it. Well, for it was what it was I kind of portrayed it. as being what it was, as as what you hoped it would be, and then yeah. it was very different. I enjoyed it for what it was. I was disappointed it wasn't what I thought it was going to be, but I thought, okay, that's marketing. I, it, more for me. Yeah, yeah. true, true. Yeah. Production design true. on it was absolutely stunning, first rate. Mm. Production lots of toys, Agreed. lots of great, yeah. great sets. And um, but the the CGI um, for the airlift for for Market Garden on that was really good. I thought. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The best bit um, of film, without doubt. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And um, so it would have been that quality. Uh, for the for the air armada going over sure. um, and then um when we did the landing well we were going to have warwick and um i think it's ainsworth john ainsworth and jim warwick were in glider 91 we were going to have both of them on cables and we were going to build um the cockpit just on its own and film it upside down with camera underneath so we were going to shoot them going through the glass like that. Oh, wow! Um, yeah. on, wow. On, on, on wires, and that was going what to be a great shot. Of, that was going to be one of the most expensive um, stunts. And our, our stunt director, stunt coordinator, sorry, um, Steen Young, who, who shares my middle name, um, uh, he he was going to be d- dealing with all that. So it was, it was going to be a combination of CGI, um, full size set, bits of set, cuts of stunts, and things like that. Um, with the glider scraping along the ground, I don't know if we would have done one model shot and then used it, cut to it six times like they did in um, The Longest Day. Um, that would have been you could have done that nice and it nod. could have been a reference. That, you know, that <laughs> yeah. Be, yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, 
uh, there was a lot of discussion about should we do some miniature um, work, and I think ultimately that was ruled out. The the, the thing that we were going to do was um, we we were going to use a drone to track the exact same route um, of the landscape. Um, we were going to film that twice, once at night and once at day, and I think once at um, magic hour, uh, just as the sun has gone down. And then Alan was going to take that footage and remove all the modernisms and using the photographs, the aerial reconnaissance photographs that we had of the bridge at the time, he was going to re-replicate the landscape exactly as, as it was. Wow. And that that was going to be your POV of the gliders coming in. So your POV of the gliders coming into the bridge would have been exactly the same. And they kind of did that in the longest day. They did a helicopter yeah. shot yeah. Um, for a bit of it. And uh, then they cut to a crane shot for, for when it came in really close. Mm. Um, so we were gonna we were gonna do that. Um, and I mean it's amazing when you look at the helicopter shot in the longest day, how much the terrain uh, around the bridge area, which is now the museum and car parks and all the rest of it, how much it, it hadn't changed that much from World War II back then. You're mm -hmm. only 20 years later, you know. Mm, uh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, so um and it comes back, it comes back to that thing is where we can all see this now when you're talking about it. You can yeah. see it in our heads and it gets bloody worked. <laughs> So yeah, next quick we knew how we were gonna I knew how I was gonna shoot everything. I mean I was directing it as well. That was well of course. Good. Um the next question is from Jamie D. Um maybe he's unsure of, of the production uh storyline. Uh, but he asked, given the popularity of Second World War films and series over the years, why does Lance think the film is stalling? And has he did you consider crowdfunding? Yeah, I get asked this question a lot. Um so um well, I mean, the reason that, that there were lots of reasons that the production kept stalling, there was a lot of unfortunate timings of other things. Like, for example, um, when Brexit happened, you see, once the, the, the original source of money was not apparent, we then looked at what are all the other funding options, OK? And one of the other funding options that, that you had at the time, which a lot of kind of £5 million and under, budget movies were doing was they would go to the what was called the three european country film production fund and that meant if you shot something in france something in germany and you're filming the uk and it didn't matter if it was like 60 percent in the uk 20 percent in france and 20 percent in germany as long as you filmed in three countries you could um access this production deal which was a mix of tax breaks and things like that. And you got about one third of the budget got paid for by this, okay. this, this fund. Um, and we applied for that funding actually for another film, this script I wrote, especially for Judy Dench, um, which didn't happen. Um, this was another project I was trying to get off the ground, same time as Pegasus um, romantic comedy. And, um, uh, and that one we, we put through the system mm. and, um, and it got kicked off when, um, th when the Brexit, happened the italian um people in charge of that fund it was an italian version of that fund all the british projects all got kicked off mm. and then they were and then we all complained and then they were forced to put us back on again but then of course we didn't get picked so right. um uh so we knew that that, that that we heard from other people that their projects were, were already in that process they were already in there um they all got put to the bottom of the pile because there'll be 50 50 or 60 projects that would apply for this this thing and they weren't all allowed to get on they would they would let so many on sure um, so anybody that was from the uk after the brexit vote <laughs> because the people who were in charge of this production fund by the way were based in i think it was luxembourg or belgium or somewhere okay <laughs> the committee the committee so i mean yeah. you know basically england's just gone and done that so what, what, for those readers watching, I just gave uh, Matthew... He flipped the, he flipped the bird. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so what do you think these yep. people were thinking? Well, we, uh, yeah, let's pull the British projects through. Yeah, great. So um, so Brexit caused us a lot of problems. Not only that as well, there was a lot of um, independent um, financing sources we were talking to around that time, just independent people that could, could have brought in half a mil here, 200 grand there. Sure. That kind of thing. All of whom, well, you know, at that point, just no, you know, because there was a lot of financial um, impact, in the, in, yeah. especially in the short term, to businesses. 
So suddenly kind of all these places that sort of said, yeah, we'd like to get involved, we'd like to put a bit of money in, they all just suddenly disappeared. Um, so in addition to the main funding source stalling, then all the other things we were looking at also all started closing up. Um, and like I said, I did go out and find my own investor, but then sure. how I, I made a mistake on how I handled that and paid a big price for it. So, um, yeah, so that didn't happen. So, so the second part of that question was about crowdfunding. Yes. Okay, so at this point, we realised that the budget needed to be about $9 million because certain people were going to take such a massive wedge of the cake that we needed at least six million to shoot on the film. Right. So um, uh, um, there, was, there was no way. I looked at the most successful crowdfunding campaigns of all time, and even though we had a following of 30,000, there was no way that we could have done a crowdfunding campaign. And the problem was as well, 9% of that crowdfunding money would not have gone to the film. Yeah. That's a, that, that, that's a big chunk, okay, due to due to contract things that had been not flagged up by the person's job who it was to flag up such things. So um, so that, again, would have been like, Jesus Christ, now we've got to give 9% of this away. And, and I would have had to have done all the work for that on top yes. of everything else. By the time the money was stalling, you know, we had a core production team of 12. By the time the money... By the time we were going into 2017, mid 2017, you know, six of those people were not really proactively involved anymore. And right. by the end, of, by the very end of it, it was basically me and Alex Tabrizi um, mm. that were running around trying to find the money. Who I need to give a massive shout out to, who's a little documentary filmmaker. He's an actor, uh, does various bits and pieces. Current currently working at a theatre in Sarancester, I think, doing their technical stuff for them. And still, um, occasionally, me and him will have a little meeting to see if there's anything else we can try that we haven't, you know. Sure, sure. But crowdfunding was never really an option. And I think the proof of the pudding in that was because at this point, the rights to the, to the script were owned by Pegasus Bridge Film Limited, of which had a number of company directors, of which I was one. I, I'm no longer. I, I resigned from that a long time ago. But um, so I couldn't take the script and go and try and make it on my own. I had to make it with that company. Um, and I didn't get the rights back until the end of 2019, I think it was. So that's how the paratrooper project came about. Cause I thought, okay, we can't get 9 million. Can we make another film that will use all the assets that we've set up that will be a different movie, but we can use to somehow then kickstart, you know, what sure we're trying thing. to do. And yeah. then maybe come back to Pegasus Bridge. And that was the story of Sidney Cornell, one of the first, if not the first, black paratroopers to um, serve in the British Army, who dropped with seven para. Mm. And I worked out I could shoot his story for 250 grand and it'd be like a Band of Brothers TV pilot. Yeah. And yeah. Um, European, European Band of Brothers TV pilot. And what I did was... Um, that was how the shoot with the two t two tanks came about, and Michael McGee, because they were both characters that were already in Pegasus Bridge. Um, and the one scene that occurs, like I said earlier, in both scripts is Michael McGee charging the, the tanks. So um, I thought, well, okay, let's do a crowdfunder and let's see. And we created some pretty cool perks. And, um, and you know, anyone will tell you crowdfunding is a proper ball lake. Um, yeah. you've, got yeah, it's every, you've got to be on it every day. You need a team. You need, like, three or four people. Uh, I mean, we've got a GoFundMe up for a play at the minute, and we're, we're we're not doing anywhere near as much work on that as we should be. But we just needed to get it up because people mm -hmm. get to put it up. But um, so, and we got eleven grand, and then I think we did it on um, I think it was a Kickstarter, if I remember rightly. And of that eleven grand, uh, I think we ended up with about. I think it was after after we'd, we we ended up with nine, but then after we had also then given everybody their perks, All we perks. had seven and a half. Because, mm. you know, printing yeah. T-shirts and crew jackets and mugs and then posting them to places from United States to Norway to Russia, that costs a lot of money. Yeah. Um, so we had about seven and a half grand. So with that seven and a half grand, we shot that, that tank scene, which I shot for about six grand, got the two tanks for three grand, got all the extras and everything, you know. Sure, sure looked after everybody for the day. And then Tony and I then went to Arnhem and Deventer to do some little bits of 
bits of footage uh, for the paratrooper trailer from there just to make it look a bit bigger. Mm. But we, the point is, to you know, going back to the original question, we only got 11 grand. And this was before the financial uncertainty of the time we're living in now. Yes. There is no way you're going to raise... I mean, I wouldn't need to raise nine million. I could shoot the film for six because I don't have to pay three million to cretins. So, um, <laughs> of course. I could I could shoot the film for six, but there's no way you're gonna you're gonna get six million. I mean, Will Jordan, um, who you might know as the critical drinker on YouTube, yeah. um, I know Will pretty well, and he's got a massive pool. He's got a million and a half um, subscribers, and um, uh, and he's a really good film critic. He he really knows his stuff because he's a writer and he understands story and he understands narrative and all that stuff sort of stuff. And um, he's just done a crowdfunder for a short about Ryan Drake, about the, the guy um, in his books. And um, their target was 30 grand, and he's raised 350,000. Wow. Now, that's that's 350,000 <clears throat> with a following of one and a half million people, plus periphery around that, 350,000, yeah. not 9 million or 6 yeah, million. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, you know... There's no way you you you've got to have to do a film of this caliber. You've got to have some proper money because you've you know Rupert Penry Jones and these people they don't work for a hundred pound a day like you know some of our. No, I mean our you know that's what our we were going to have a company unit of of twenty guys, twenty key extras, a bit like Attenborough's army. He had about yeah. fifty. We were going to have twenty. It would have been on like 100 quid a day. And we spoke to a load of people um, uh, who might have been interested in that. And I said, look, you might end up with a line here. You might end up with a line there, but you'll be on this shoot. And they were all up for it. You know, there was a lot of young living history guys. They didn't need to be actors. They just needed to know how to use the kit and the weapons. And they were all going to come aboard. And we were talking, you know, people that were between 18 to 24. We're not talking yes. fat guys in their 40s. Um, and... Um, so all of those things were were, were 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 looked at, but you know, principal actors, um, you know, even even sort of not not a list, but big name, well respected actors coming in to do this part or that part, anywhere between twenty to fifty grand, sure and, and yeah, you know, and your unknowns that are playing key roles that are on the show are going to be on weekly rates of two to two and a half thousands, so. You know, and then think of the catering. The, the, the catering. Yeah, yeah. it's all this behind the scenes things that people don't think of. Yeah, our crew was going to be. We 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 kept our crew as small as we could, including a second unit director that was going to be Matthew Holmes, my my buddy who's just done Legend of Ben Hall, which is a great historical Australian bush ranger movie. And if you ever want to get him on your channel, I'll I'll, I'll get him for you guys. I'm sure he'd love to do an interview with you guys. Oh, he loves his cool. Australian Australian history. He's really oh, wow. big. On that. <clears throat> Um, so, um, yeah, he was going to do the second unit, but our crew was going to be 32, 32 people, three cameras, camera team of a camera technical team, about six people, first, second, third AD, you know, and, and a makeup team with three, um, and, um, so on and so on. But it was, it was a really scaled down unit. And, and we got that unit together when we shot the promo trailer, which was, we were asked to do that for, for the big investors to get the, get the big money. And we, you know, so we shot a kind of a concept trailer. This is what the film's about, and this is kind of what it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. um, part of the reason that I haven't put that in in public is because it, it you know, it was just what we could get at the time. Yeah, um, it's just not, representative it's not, of yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not the footage from the movie, and um, if I put it up online and put it in public domain, you know, the bean counters will be out. Or rivet counters, sorry, and um, they'll be like, "Oh, Panzer three, you know, no, twenty first Panzer didn't have any of them, and, and all that kind of thing." Well, you know, this is a concept trailer, and at the time, somebody said, "Would you like my working Panzer 3? Yeah, you're not going to turn it. You're not going to turn it that, down, are you? That yeah. was the only tank we could get. So, yes, please, thank you very much. Of course. Hello, I'm Al Murray, and you're listening to Fighting on Film, the world's number one war film podcast. Coming off of that, I mean, you know, the, the money is, you know, the amount of money that you need is, it's not big in film terms, I guess, but it's big in, you know, people terms, six million, when you hear that fee. 
But yeah. my, 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 one of my like final questions, and I mean, now, I mean, hopefully, I know you're going on World War II TV later on in the week. I mean, by the time this episode goes yeah. live, your book with the, the screenplay would have been released and everyone can read it. But I guess my question is, realistically, I mean, I know that everyone would still love to see this project made. What would it, what would it take you to get it off the ground again? God, some rejuvenation youth energy pills. Does such, <laughs> yeah. such a thing exist? I mean, look, I'm I'm 50 now. And, um, you know, when I started um, trying to make the film, you know, I was in my, my early 40s. I was in a um, loving relationship with a fantastic partner, you know, uh, and... Um, had a lot of kind of hopes and dreams, not just for the film. Uh, uh, my biggest dream of which was let's get this made in time for the 75th and get every living veteran that's mm. left at that anniversary. And there would have been about five or six. I'm, I'm now found myself single again at 50, which is a fucking horrible place to, to be. The personal cost to me to try and get this made was was pretty big. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because because when it didn't happen, I I spent three years of my life pretty much every day yeah. working full yeah, time. Yeah, it comes through in your introduction. It's really, you know, before you start reading the words, it's very hard hitting in a very personal way. There's that great line from the one of my favourite films of all time, The Wild Geese, Richard, the late great Richard Burton. You know, there are eleven still men. There are eleven men still living. I haven't even counted the widows and orphans yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. sums up how he feels about that whole operation and I think I've put that quote in the book somewhere or if I haven't it's going in um, sure and and it's like this open wound you know mm. um, I, I also person I feel personally responsible okay. um, but I let all these people down because every single veteran said to me before they died at the end of the interview without exception you know when I would go is there anything else you want to say yeah fucking hurry up because I'm going to be dead soon um, now my health mm. is not not great at the moment. Um, I've had some really serious health issues in the last twelve months, and it's, it was touch and go at one point whether I was even going to be here till the end of um, this year. So the, the, one of the reasons that the book I'm putting the script out is so that my version of it is there, sure so thing. people can see what I wanted to do. Uh, people will know how passionate I was about it because Come to the cross. armchair general kind of following the. The, the the social media over the years getting excited wow it's a british team and they're going to make this film it sounds really good no it hasn't happened now god what a bunch of monkeys you know well, yeah, they, they must yeah. have been a bunch of muppets i get it i get it i, I get that i get that completely uh, you know i'm sure i've done that when i've been following some film and i've been saying jesus christ isn't it out yet i think i've said no, that about just, you know, just get oh, it made it's so easy Master, it? we, yeah. we've all said that about masters of the air about 20 times <laughs> i think we have yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Tom. That's Tom Hanks and, and Steven Spielberg. Look how long that took to get financed. Yeah, yeah. And you had the success of Band of Brothers. You would have thought it could got financed yeah. like that. They were, and they. I think they spent about hundred. Was it six hundred million on it? Six hundred million. Six hundred eighty million. Yeah, and then Apple bought Something it off else. HBO for the same mm. price and covered the rest of the cost because. HBO yeah. couldn't but, afford it or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, it, it. You know. So just look at the complexities of that. I of mean. So in terms of my hopes now, there's a weird thing that's happened in the film industry where films are getting made at this really stupid level of 600 million, right? Mm. Whatever. Marvel film, you know. Yeah. And if you make a Marvel film for less than 100 million, that's a low-budget Marvel film, if such a thing exists. Yeah. I, I know that there was one that was made for around 180 and I think, you know, 160 of that was like the rock salary or something. So, um, <laughs> you, you know, I mean, and what's happened over the years is that different changes in the financial markets and stuff you have shifted so that on you've got all, all of those films have gone there. And then on the other extreme end of that, you've got people like um, some of my contemporaries, uh, you know, Richard Oakes, Adam Leader, um, um, Jimmy Bush, Rain McCormick, uh, to name James um, McCormack, to name a few really talented filmmakers, sort of in my age bracket, mm. running around snatching a hundred grand here, fifty grand there, two hundred grand here, and making these tiny films. 
um, some of which are great and some of which are not so great, with extreme limitations. And then the, the, the mid-budget film, 20 million, 6 million, 7 million, 15 million, you know, have all but disappeared. Getting that amount of money for some reason seems to be really hard because mm. as soon as you, you're, you're working on a, a movie and, let's say, Henry Cavill gets attached, suddenly you'll have 20 producers wanting to put money into it uh, yeah. because, because um, Henry Cavill's in it or, or whoever. <laughs> So it suddenly goes from a £7 million film to a £70 million film to a £170 million film. But those 20 producers are going to take about £60 million quid of that money, just so you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Everyone gets their piece, don't they? Yeah. They, oh, yeah. So, you know, and then, and then your A-list star gets a big chunk of that. And yet, haven't you noticed how now, whenever there's a big A-lister in a TV show, they're also a producer? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And the reason that... Mm-hmm. that the, that deal is normally worked out for, for the benefit of your listeners on the basis of come and frontline our TV show. Okay, your salary will be this, but your back end will be this of yeah, international yeah. sales, and you'll also be a producer. Great, yeah, I'll do that. And everybody um, remembers how much Jack Nicholson made from the Batman movie, you see. So if people are convinced that a TV series is going to be a success. They're up for that. So, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, I, I, this film could still be made for, for uh, you could make a good version of this film, a really good version of this film, if shot the way that I intended it to be shot with the assistance of all the people I intended to be involved for between 10 and 20 mil. I mean, yeah. look, I'd love somebody to step forward and say, hey, guess what? I won the Euro lottery on Tuesday. It was 177 million pounds. Um, I really don't need all that money. Um, here's 20 million with a lot of stipulations and let me and, invest for you. And, yeah, and an, account, an accountants that are going to keep careful control of the money. Um, mm. But you know, go and make your film. I mean, God, you know, I think every filmmaker dreams of that. I think the the, the big difference between this and a lot of other films is I was trying to make something about real people that really did extraordinary things and their families were going to get to sit in the cinema their relatives and go yeah that was my grandfather or that was my father mm. and great somebody's told the story of of what he did and now it's around forever it's yes. there and that's how this film feels when you read a script it's you want it to yeah. be something that can be as accurate and as uh, you know realistic as you can make it to have it for prosperity and the fact you've you've recorded these veteran interviews as well even if even if you publish a screenplay and you don't get your film off the ground launch you've still got something very useful in, in those <laughs> yeah. interviews if anything has come out of this you have those for prosperity because they're no longer here and that's something that i think is very good yeah um, there's, a, there's, I, a, there's a plan to release those um in the not too distant future on the Outcast Creative channel, which is my YouTube channel. So yeah, people please listen. go and subscribe, everybody, to that one. We'll have links yeah. after the show. Just as we're recording, Rob Hughes over on uh, the supporting cast, the Patreon, has mm-hmm. asked the exact question Rob asked first about uh, who you would cast as Richard Todd. Um, so it's funny that everybody's asking about Richard Todd, but not Major Howard. Um, I know. <laughs> well, I, I guess because I think it's, it's him iconic, being isn't it? him, isn't it? I think that's why it's so interesting. Because when I was mm. reading the script, I've always been like, "When's Todd coming back? When? When's Richard coming back?" The funny thing is, right? Is I'll, I'll see if I can find it while I'm talking to you. Is um, Jake Francis, who, as I explained earlier, was in the running to play Richard Todd, and he's not a main character in the film. He's got Five, six lines. Yeah, um, not many, he, no. he was, yeah, I mean, it, there's a lot of, there's a bit of poking fun at him. Like <laughs> every time he, get, he can, he checks himself out in the mirror, you know. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. he, he was every, I, I interviewed a lot of people that met him or who served with him. And the one thing that, that came through constantly was he wasn't, he was an actor's soldier. He was very vain. Mm. Uh, he was always, you know, he was always, trimming his beard and trimming his tash or whatever um so i thought well we, we need to get that in the film then and so there's a little bit like i said you've got to have humor but jake francis he actually um did a side-by-side um photograph 
of um, him in in the uniform, um, a, a sort of a photo replica of him next to Richard Todd. Um, and I'll see if I can find it and email it to you um, because it it's it's uncanny. The resemblance between the two of them was actually really really strong. Um, and you know, yeah, he sort of I guess he kind of done a few little things with Photoshop or whatever, but um, mm, mm. it did it did show because we've got this. I think I, I didn't I send you a load of pictures, including one of a very young Todd with his. Yeah, with, I think so. I think so. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was that. It was that photo, and that's. I know that's, the one. It's on. It's. I think it's on the Wikipedia article about him as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it. You know, it's him very young. He was quite old when it he seems to be the only photo that exists pre-acting of him. Like <laughs> it's the only one you ever see. Yeah, yeah it does seem so. I think. I think. <laughs> I think it is the only one. Um, yeah. Well, it's that side by side with. Jake Francis. I mean, Francis is too old to play him now. And when actually, when we were in para, when we were doing the paratrooper stuff, Jake was saying, "Am I? Would I still play Todd? Because I think Todd. Yeah, Todd is in paratrooper. In fact, he's in it a bit more. Um, and I, I said, "Well, look, whatever happens, but you know, if we got the money for paratrooper, you will be in it, and we, mm. you know, you, you will play a speaking part." what role we'll, we'll, we'll figure out later um and um yeah we never never got that far so um yeah so again i don't know let's say let's say okay let's say that it was shooting tomorrow i would probably want someone like jack loudon to play him sort of a, a, a you know up and coming well spoken yeah um a posh British actor, so you you you'd want somebody like Jack Loud and that that kind of actor. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I could think of a. a the big a, question a, is though, Lance, would you have him stand with his hands on his hips at any point in in the film? <laughs> no, in classic Todd stance. No, would you slip I'd that probably, in there. I might have hands for <laughs> luck do that. Um, yeah. By the way, did you like did you like all the German scenes with hands on luck in his headquarters and? Very good. Yeah, yeah slipping it. rumbling. Uh, all like of it. those, right. all yeah. of those scenes come directly from Hans von Luck's biography, um, mm -hmm. you know, right. the book that he wrote, which I've got, and um, great um, stories in there. And yeah, yeah, uh, I'm sure some of it's a little embellished, but all of the, all of the stuff with Hans von Luck all came directly from that book. Mm. And then, of course, I did a little nod to Bridge Too Far. And don't forget my cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't forget, don't forget mine, mine cigar. Uh, well, I also, but I like the symbolism of of you using the cigarette case where he cloaked where there's no cigarettes left. I saw that as like that's the last chance Germany's had in the war, really. Ah, uh, you picked up on that. That's what I got from that. Yeah. <laughs> so you're not you're not just a pretty face, eh? No, no, exactly. I know my <laughs> film theory just about. You know, you know. I, yeah, actually, actually, I like must the... admit to you, this this is actually the first script. That I've ever read in its entirety, and I did three years of a theatre degree, and I never once read a whole script. So you're very lucky. <laughs> I, I feel pretty honoured. I mean, I have said to people <laughs> that's that, why I got a two two though. I got an awful grade. That's probably why. But you know, <laughs> when when we were sending it out to actors, the note that I said was, um, "Get to the end of the third scene. If you get to the end of the third scene within two days, you would have read the whole thing." Yeah. And um, and that pretty much happened without, I think, yeah, it... exception. And um, if we were able to get it into an actor's hands, and we knew that they'd read it, um, and then coming on board um, seemed to happen like that. You know, it's um, very reasonable. I don't know. It would be a great novel yeah. as well. Yeah, you, know, you could make it into a novel, narrative novel. If well, you I, I mean, I actually, I actually did debate writing it in sort of novel form. Mm. Um, I think Stephen Ambrose has already done that um and it's riddled with inaccuracies it has to be said um and I, I didn't actually i hadn't even read the ambrose book when i wrote this script and actually that was funny because at one point i think that, that, that his trust got in touch when they heard the film was being made and they wanted to know if it was based on his book and it was just like no <laughs> so uh, um no i mean um I should mention um, Neil Barber, who actually you should definitely get on your your show oh, yeah. at some. Point. And um, he wrote the Pegasus and Orn River Bridges, <clears throat> and the book basically is a narrative edit of first-hand accounts of all the guys who were there. 
So these are the original accounts that were at the Imperial War Museum or with the regiments concerned. Uh, and you can find a lot of them on online. Yeah. Um, and um, I took as much as I could from first-hand accounts. And, and a lot of that came from online. Some of it came from some of the undiscovered ones came from Neil's book. In fact, I think it was Neil's book that introduced me to Sidney Cornell. I didn't know we had any black paratroopers in World War II until I read that book. And that, I, that I was... certainly didn't until your project. I had no idea. And that <clears throat> but, really raised the profile of that. And we had more than one. Had no we had more than, there were more than one. There wasn't just one guy. Mm. I think in Seventh Power alone, there were like three. Mm. Uh, and um, there's also some confusion over was Cornell this guy in this picture or was he this guy? Yes, this you mentioned that in the in the introduction um, of the screenplay. Yeah, and, um, and I've always been careful to mention that because I've got a feeling down the road scientific means will be available that somebody will say, actually, no, he's this guy. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm, you know, I hate... So a lot of the newspaper articles use that photo, don't they? And, and yeah, yeah, but I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. I'm not 100% yeah. that, that is Cornell. If it is Cornell... That is the same guy who's in the photograph with um, Colonel Pine Coffin um, yes. in Amphreville, I think it is. Um, and um, that, that is the same guy because we, we had that photo analysed. But, you know, the FBI do that thing where you can take two photos and we yeah, had somebody yeah. do that with that software and it was a 99.8% match or something. So, um, so I'm pretty convinced... That was the that is the same uh, that is the same bloke, um, but yeah. Anyway, so you know we went into a lot of detail. In fact, funny enough, when we when we were reading Neil's book, and again, like the first draft of the script had been written before I I, I wrote Neil's book, but I uh, read Neil's book. Nicola and I went through the script to try and cut roles out, and um, I was reading Neil's book at the time and and adding details and adding things, and that's when I realised we hadn't got Sidney Cornell wasn't in the script then. And I said, well, if there was a black paratrooper there, we've got to put him in. Yeah. And and, and, and Nicola um, is sort of mixed mixed race herself, Canadian, and she said, yes, yes, no, he has to he has to be in the script. But she had come round my house to cut at least two characters out of the. <laughs> Yeah. Out of the script, and and we ended up putting two in. Adding two, yeah. was it? Yeah, yeah we added, two guys, add, yeah. We added him, and we added Major Taylor, who I think was originally just like a nondescript, non-speaking part officer. Really, he was a great right. extra. And so that's quite important to the whole script, that isn't he? Really, so yeah. It's a big uh, yeah, I, 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 I was very adamant from day one that you know this person who did this action has to be played by this person. Mm -hmm. I didn't want a Colonel Bobby Stout. Um, or, or uh, uh, you know, the various. There's two or three characters in Bridge Too Far that are amalgamations. There's a That's German it. general Ludwig, I think, is like a an amalgamation of Haaser and various other mm. uh, German officers that did a good job of kicking the British British ass. And then Colonel Bobby Stout is a combination of a couple of different American guys from the 101st. And and I, yeah. that's fine with Bridge Too Far because it's such a bigger. Mm. story it's it's mm. long to stay again but about this battle but yeah. mine is more micro so mm. I, I felt really we, we we shouldn't be doing that with this no. film and you don't take james khan off for a mini movie in the middle of your movie which is a good I, thing you know what <laughs> i really enjoyed that discussion and uh one i was sitting there um feeling very annoyed that i wasn't part of it because i wanted to say something about that somewhere out there um <clears throat> not that I might have done it. There is an edit of Bridge Too Far, which has all the Band of Brothers stuff in it. Uh, and, all, yeah. and all the Khan stuff taken out. Mm. Uh, I must say, I really did enjoy watching that version of Bridge Too Far on my Blu-ray. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you need to see that edit of Bridge yeah. Too Far. Well, we Very always good. say there's an edit of Bridge Too Far that incorporates pieces of uh, There's Is The Glory in it and everything mm. else to really... You know, bolster out that used to be perimeter a bit. Well, but, there, you know, this is not a this is not an untrue story. There was a version of Bridge Too Far released in the eighties, briefly on one video label. Completely true story that has got five scenes in it that are not in any other version. 
Ooh, and no. um, this, listen, this, I've got to tell you this because your readers, will, your listeners will be interested. Me awesome. and my friend Paul Wilkins, who I went to school with, he was the first guy in my school that had a video recorder. And one of the first films he video recorded was Bridge Too Far. So pretty much every Saturday for like the next three months, I would go to Paul's house and we would watch Bridge Too Far again. And like his mother would stick her head around the corner, come in with chips and beans for us. And Are you watching Bridge Too Far again? Anyway, <laughs> fast forward about five, six years, he's at a car boot sale. And he comes across a copy of a VHS, Bridge Too Far, with a slightly different cover. Um, it was a radically different cover, actually. Uh, it wasn't a bootleg or anything, proper label and all the rest of it. And he, 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 did, he just had the one recorded off the TV, which had the, had the adverts from ITV in it. You know, He took it home. And he, he's on the phone to me half an hour later. Lance, you've got to come around. I've got Bridge Too Far. I'm like, yeah, we've seen it 50 times. No, 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 no. <laughs> I've got a different version of a Bridge Too Far that I've just picked up at a car boot sale. You need to see this. So I come round, and I've got the original script. And, there, and, and I don't know if you've read the original script, but the original script, there's a few scenes that are missing. One of the scenes, for example, is the pan away to the, to the German boots crossing the road just after the paras have, have headed into Arnhem. Ah. It's one of those scenes. That was in there. So um, uh, there's, there's another bit where a platoon of uh, American soldiers from the 82nd are going through the streets and the actor is not very good. The actor who's got the dialogue in this scene is not very good, so I think this is why it was cut. And his right. line, I remember it, was, Nine Megan Bridge has got to be around here somewhere. Uh, I don't know, Lieutenant. I can't see it on this map. It's like just like a two-line dialogue. And then suddenly a pair of shutters opens up and there's, there's an MG42 in it starts machine gunning the Germans, and then another one opens up here. So the, a load of the Americans are killed. They run around um, a street, run up an alleyway, and at the end of that alleyway, there is that same vehicle that machine guns the human roadblock, you know, the kind of the oh, yeah. covered SPV with the two MGs in it. That's it, yeah, yeah. And they're all killed. And th that scene actually sort of shows how difficult it was to get into Nijmegen, and it's a shame that it's not in the in the finished film. How this version of this film got released, I've no idea. The other thing that was in it was there <coughs> were several black and white shots of Thirty Corps, which looked like actual newsreel footage. So it seemed mm. to me like somehow this was an earlier edit that somehow got delivered to the video transfer place by accident. And there were these um, limited number uh, released. So now we're going to have to hunt for this copy of Bridge Too it's, Far. It's the back out of there this. somewhere. This is not a dream. I, I physically saw it. I recontacted right. Paul. I got back in touch with Paul on Facebook. We hadn't spoken for many years. And he said, oh, it's put up in the loft. And he went up to find it, and then, then his wife said, no, we threw out that box of VHS tapes ages ago. Oh, oh, oh no. Even a picture well, of the cover so you could have found it. Yeah, I know. If, oh. if we ever find someone it. Somewhere, someone somewhere must have that version. They've got it. Someone's it got it. It must be out there. because If it's found, Lance, you can come on and we'll do a Bridge Too Far Redux. The Lost and we'll the do, lost yeah. scenes. Yeah, and we'll <laughs> yeah. do an, an, a fresh episode five. on it different bits and i'll tell you another bit that was different was you know the attack over the bridge it's got a load of it's a, it's a different edit okay the there's a load of slightly different angles and slightly mm. different shots well i mean from from what we were talking about with the uh the apa lads a couple of years ago now like they definitely filmed way more than was used so yeah yeah, yeah you know it, yeah. there's it's amazing but no i mean you know getting back to pegasus bridge like it, that and that's how I feel like your movie was gonna be. You wouldn't leave those scenes out. You know, everything in your film isn't I wouldn't cut much. You know, I might, as I said earlier, the John Howard bit at the end, I didn't in you know, wasn't for me. But now when you've explained it, actually I'm like, no, no, keep that in because it is it's all based I think on it, true I events. Think it, I think it's quite pivotal because you need to you need to explain somehow why is this story important now? Yeah, of course. You know. And it's important now because look at what's going on in Ukraine. It makes what those people did in that time even more extraordinary. For yeah. you to be being a postman one day or a milk milk boy or something, you know, working in a factory, 
one week and then be traveling to France in a balsa wood, um, you know, aeroplane landing yeah. in enemy territory at night between two very narrow waterways with a, a, a machine gun as a weapon that could go off and shoot you in the leg at random moments. Uh, you know, fighting a well-trained enemy that's in an entrenched position. Just, just, I, I just, you know, that this is this is kind yeah. of beyond imagination. And, that, and, like, and, that, and that's why I think the film, the film that is is still very relevant, and that's why we we wanted to invite you on to promote your screenplay because, you know, we really hope that you you know you get that energy boost and it or the financial injection from somewhere and it, and it can come about and hopefully you know with the power of twitter and you know woody's audience our audience and people who are hungry for war movies and war movies like this hopefully something can come about for you and and this is what we really want <laughs> yeah that's a yeah, sort of end I, there i always like to use the word historical um over war um because I would never, the, the purpose of making this film would never be to promote war. Oh, no, not at all. Yeah, of course. I mean, obviously, people like watching, in quotes, war movies because they're exciting. They're about pe daring people doing daring mm. things. And um, they're gripping and they're entertaining. And it would be all of those things. But you're also saying, guys, this really happened. Yeah, no, I've got, and this is what right. it falls into. We, we yeah. on the show, we are very um, at length. We do say, you know, there are movies that replicate it and try their best to, i.e. You, you bridge too fast, you're theirs is the glories. But then there are movies like Force 10 from Navarone, Guns and Navarone that are like war adventure films, but yours really yeah. does fit into this. This is how it was vain. These are real people. These are real things. You know, you, your river boat's coming down. You, you you read it in a book and you probably, oh, that never happened. But no, you go away, you listen to the accounts. No, no, guys did assault, a take on boats, you know, on a river. Yeah. And this is the thing, you know, once it's on film, people start to connect the dots a little more. They go, oh, yeah, that happened because it was in that movie. I saw it on screen, you know. And that's one of the things that you know, we hope going forward that you do get to do. Yeah, and it regenerates interest in the subject. And Of um, course, of course. You know, and exactly. Good, good business for the region of Normandy and yeah. all of those extremely well-run it's music. that whole thing they say history's dying out, but we, you know, we've seen proven time and time again that it's a big sort of bounding leap thing. Where it's always yeah. going to keep going. And it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you, Lance. And if you are at odds of what to buy, the uh, war movie uh, airborne fan in your life, um, there's a few other uh, uh, parachute regiment books floating around. But please go out and buy um, Lance's screenplay of Pegasus Bridge. It'll be available on Amazon. Uh, we will have. We will have links to it plastered all over our website and our Twitter page, and you can go and buy it from there. And Lance, again, thanks for talking to us, and Merry Christmas. Uh, thank you, and uh, it should be available, I think, around December the 15th, give or take a day. Okay. Um, once you send these things and sign them off, um, it can be a bit... It can sure. take two days, it can take ten. So the, the week of release of this podcast, so it's absolutely fantastic so, yeah, time. It should be out around now, listeners. Yes. It's, it's, almost, it's almost like okay. we planned this. It, yeah. It's incredible, isn't it? <laughs> right. And uh, and as again, you know, thanks for joining us, Lance. And as always, you can find the show on all the social media platforms apart from OnlyFans. We're not quite on there yet. We've got to slim down a little bit over Christmas. Um, and <laughs> but if you... <laughs> but if Only you do... fans fighting on film. <laughs> Only films. <laughs> Only films. That's what we say. Um, so um, do you find the entire uh, back catalogue of the show at fightingonfilm.com. And if you have a foth binge over our Christmas break, do let us know and we'll catch you next week for Where Eagles Dare with Jeff Dyer. Thanks, Lance. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye.